guys, Ryan here again. Uh, as promised, um, you may have noticed that I am wearing the exact same clothes the last time I spoke to you. And that is because it is just a few minutes later in my time. But for you, it might be a couple days later as I've had time to go back and edit this video. Um, but I thought I've been sort of itching to talk to you guys about Bakanawa. And I thought, what better time than the present? Um, because as far as I know, there's not any YouTube content out there about this psychedelic plant yet. And I'm sure as soon as I put it out there, other people will see. And, you know, people with far better reputations than me, um, with my no reputation, will be putting out content on it. So let's talk about this plant. Um... I first learned about it in a web course that I took a couple years ago. Um, it was a diploma in psychoactive plants that I took through the Center of Excellence, um, which is as corny as it sounds, but they are basically a alternative health or holistic or spiritual or whatever you want to call it, this whole hippy-dippy, wookie uh, category we all find ourselves in who are part of this community out of the UK, um, this outfit. And basically it was a book, a big old textbook, a web course and with some quizzes and tests and an audio uh, course. So overall, you know, I paid 25 British pounds uh, for it. So that was pretty darn good deal. And um, through that process, I learned about so many more psychoactive plants than I ever would have, um, including a lot of the European witchcraft plants, which I wasn't well versed in before. Um, stuff from all over North and South America, Africa, you know, you, I learned about Iboga. Um, so as it sits now, I feel much more versed in psychoactive plants than before I took this course. So that's pretty cool. But there were several really obscure plants in there that I think they did a very good job covering. And one that piqued my interest in particular was called Bakanawa. Or I think the individual of it is Bakanawi. Um, so this is a plant used by the Terra Humera down in Mexico. And it is a bulrush named Scirpus acutus. So if you have ever found a bulrush or know what a bulrush is, basically it's like a cattail or a shoot. It grows around um, swamps, rivers, streams, ponds, lakes. Um, you know, just that big kind of grass-like plant growing out of the water. Um, we have them all over the United States. They grow down into Mexico. They do grow um, in my region as well. Um, but... You know, I don't know if it's the exact strain. So uh, true to form, I was actually able to figure out a seed supplier and find some. And I'm working on growing it now. Um, let's let's talk about it a little bit. Because um, first of all, this video is purely educational. Um, I want approximately zero people to listen to this and go out and haphazardly start foraging and looking for bulrush roots because there are so many different kinds of bulrush out there that are um, for a lot of people going to be very difficult to disambiguate and very difficult to decide and parse out which exact species this is. Um, you know, is this Scirpus acutus or is this Scirpus atrovirens, which is a very closely related one? You're going to have a hard time figuring that out. In fact, some of the original research... Um, was in the Encyclopedia of Psychoactive Plants, I believe it's called, by Christopher Rash. And if, I believe he had some co-authors in there, maybe, but I, I believe it's Christopher Rash is the primary, or Rash, R-A-A-S-C-H. Um, he mentions uh, the Bacchanawa, and he believes that it is Scirpus um, Outrovirens, as well as he put out a book previously um, in collaboration with um, Richard Evan Schultes and Ho Hoffman. So Schultes, Hoffman, and Rash, which is like the dream team, put out a book together. 
on psychoactive plants, and they mentioned it in there. Lo and behold, they said it was Scirpus outrovirens as well. So, um, luckily, as I was going through my research process, I went deep, deep diving into the literature um, on the academic side, because that's how I tend to approach research when I'm looking at um, different psychedelics. Of course, I love, I love, love, love some Arrowhead uh, trip logs, some trip diaries, trip experiences. Um, that stuff is cotton candy to me. I will read that till the cows come home. If you look up Bakanawa on Arrowhead, there aren't any entries. Um, this is not something obscure-ish like Hawaiian Baby Woodrose or um, Vilka or Yopo, as it's called. Um, you know, it's not something like Ayahuasca where people have heard about it. And people have done it, and if you go to the right place, you can do it with a shaman. Um, this is still a relatively unknown thing, except for um, some people like me who like to read obscure psychoactive plant material out there. Um, it's kind of a weird hobby that I have. Um, but hopefully you guys can listen to this and do some research on it yourself, because I've kind of hit a wall. So I'm kind of calling you to action to um, go out there and learn more about Scirpus acutus. So the earliest research, I think it was 1971, and this is just off the top of the dome, um, from the Journal of, um, I think, Ethnopharmacological Plants, or no, the Journal of Ethnopharmacology, I believe it was. Um, 1971, uh, gentleman uh, Robert A. By, B-Y-E, um, wrote a paper about um, ethnopharmacology of the Terra Humera, um, which again is that tribal group down in, or indigenous group, whatever your preferred term is, I don't mean to offend anybody, um, group down in Mexico. So um, that group of folks uses the Bacanawa root, so the root of this bulrush medicinally. And um, I read about it as well in a book um, about Terra Humera medicine. And a di that pointed me to a dissertation by a gentleman um, named Enrique, Dr. Enrique Salmon, who I've been, first off, tracked down a copy of his dissertation and read what he had to say about Bacanawa. And um, he believes he's correctly identified it as Scirpus acutus. So that is the most, of a, as of about, I think, 2009, the most recent um, determination is that this is Scirpus acutus. And here's the reason I believe him. First of all, um, Enrique Salmon is actually a Terra Humera himself. So when you're talking about ethnopharmacology or oral tradition or history of a, an indigenous group, my rule of thumb is always to believe um, the first-hand respondents. So, you know, Dr. Selmon is Terra Humera. He says it is Scirpus acutus. Um, I don't think he has any vested interest in lying to me about that. I think that he probably knows better than Christopher Rash or, um, you know, Robert A. Bai with his original paper. Um, because basically nobody uh, knew what it was until Dr. Salmon published on this. Um, they poked around on what ba Bacchanawa could have been because the linguistics of that term could mean root, you know, Bacana can mean root in their language, or they also, some there are some kinds of cactus, cacti, um, that uh, have the prefix Bacana or Bacani. So um, a lot of times with these languages, you can say Bacana or Bacani or Bacanawa, and it can mean a few different things in their language. So depending on context, depending on who you're talking to, depending on whether you're an outsider or insider, Bacana might mean a few different things, especially because as a non-native speaker, uh, researchers typically mispronounce things and misunderstand other cultures. So um, first-hand account from Dr. Salman, that's what I'm going to go for. I'll give you a little history. People... Um, 
thought that Scirpus acutus was at one time a kind of peyote, or perhaps a pseudonym for peyote. Um, they thought it was Scirpus outroverans, a related um, bulrush that has totally different alkaloids in it. Um, or, you know, they've postulated it could have been all kinds of different things across the board. Um, so I was really fortunate that Dr. Um, Salman was willing to talk to me about this interesting plant. Um, to give you a little bit of background on it, um, culturally, what it's used for, um, any of you who've heard about the Terra Humera, those folks are very good uh, long-distance runners. Um, that's something they're kind of known for in that culture. Um, they might use this stuff as a poultice on their legs and feet um, before a major long run. They might m microdose some of the root, from my understanding, just a little nibble um, in very small amounts. But basically, it's supposed to increase endurance, so it may have some sort of stimulating effect to it. Um, but typically, the use of the whole root is reserved for very, very special occasions. So the shamans will actually sometimes carry some of it in a pouch around their neck. Um, they, at peyote ceremonies, they will actually put it up on the altar um, because however powerful peyote is, this stuff is presumed to be even more powerful. So they use it as sort of a totem, if that makes sense, or a fetish um, during those ceremonies. So... Um, that's kind of interesting that even though they are a peyote group, they have peyote in their culture. It's very important to them. This is sort of the even highest plant, and it has been sort of a well-kept secret for, um, obviously, a very long time. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to tell some folks about this and also advocate for if you do end up exploring it, please do so with uh, cultural respect um, because... And the other part of this being an important part of their culture is that it is an important part of their culture, right? So um, we have a tendency as Westerners to um, appropriate some of these plants, plant medicines as our own. So while I do think it's my personal belief that anybody should be allowed to use any plants into their body that they want to, um, I also think it's very important to honor the traditions of these people and approach it very, very respectfully. If you do, um, if you have the opportunity to go out and interact with the shaman and try to um, ask for their help with it, ask for their insight, their wisdom, that's fine. And if you choose to go it alone, that's not something I'll judge you over either. Um, but just know that traditionally in their culture, it's only used as an intervention for extreme cases of mental health. Um, improvement. So someone who has, say, bipolar or depression in a very serious way might receive Bakanawa. Um, what's interesting about this to me, though, and of course, I, I shouldn't proceed without saying, um, you know, Dr. Salman made very clear to me to, that I should mention that a um, the shamans in their community get very special, very in-depth training and are called to that training to use and administer this root. Um, so although I am growing it out of curiosity for myself, no, I can't send you some. No, I won't send you some. Um, no, I don't, I'm not even sure if I'll ever actually end up using it. I'm just trying to learn what I can about this cool plant. Um, cause I'm, I'm kind of a nerd. Um, but the other thing of it is, they say you should not cultivate it um, in their culture because there's a sound, a squealing sound or a squeaking sound that comes from the root as it grows that will drive you mad. Um, so they don't actually grow this plant at all. And my understanding is they don't really root around and forage for it either because the process of collecting this root culturally, if you damage it, um, it has a transitive property onto your body or if you damage it, some sort of misfortune will befall you. So if you, you know, hurt this root and don't treat it respectfully when you're pulling it out of the ground, you could go insane. You could uh, break your ankle. You could become broke. Your partner could leave you. Um, there's so many things that can happen transitively when you're dealing with a totemic or fetishized um, 
plant that is responsible for visionary journeys in indigenous cultures, um, it's not uncommon to see this sort of phenomenon. You see the same thing with Amanita muscaria. They think if you damage the stem uh, down at the cap, or at least some believe, not everybody, that you could, again, break your ankle. If you hit the cap and break the cap, you could, you know, break, get a skull injury. Um, so it's very similar with Bakanawa. Um, so in growing it, I do recognize there is some risk. I am going to touch it with gloves. Um, I am not part of that belief system. So, um, it's my belief that it'll probably be okay, but I'm going to exercise extreme caution, extreme care. Um, touching, handling this plant. I have a feeling there may be some alkaloids on it that if you bruise the skin might seep into your skin. I, I don't know. Maybe that's where that legend comes from. Um, and my guess is there's probably a kernel of truth to it, or maybe a lot of truth to it. So maybe you'll see me go insane in the next six months. We'll see. Um, but the, the other part of it too, um, with how they handle this. So if they're not collecting it, if they're not growing it, um, who supplies it? So actually the mestizo community who live near them or adjacent to them will actually sell it or trade with it, um, to, um, the Ramaruri to the Terahumara people. Um, so basically, um, they have an intermediary to bring this to them and then they handle it safely and respectfully without having to cultivate or harvest it. Um, so that's a really interesting network of social connections that they've set up um, around the use of this plant. So um, for those of you who don't know uh, what I mean by mestizo, um, down in Mexico or South and Central America. Basically what that is, is folks who are part uh, indigenous and part um, colonist or part uh, Spanish. So um, they might be folks who practice uh, some syncretic religious practices, like they might have Catholicism with some measure of native beliefs in there as well, um, but they might tend more towards the Western Catholic um, Cartesian divide way of thinking. So um, those folks don't have the same belief system. So for them, it's okay to pick the Bacchanawa because it doesn't violate their cultural taboos. Just like for me, it doesn't violate my cultural taboo to try to grow it and learn about it. So um, I'm not encouraging anyone to do the same, but I'm just putting out information for you and I hope you find it interesting. Um, so what do people experience when they take Bacchanawa? So this has been the hardest part for me to find out anything about. Um, so Bacchanawa, uh, that bull rush, um, what has been reported, and it's all secondhand, is people take it for mental health purposes. And they take a big dose, they lay down in the dark at night under the care of a shaman, and have a colorful visionary experience that compares very similarly to psilocybin or acid, from what I understand, LSD. Um, and of course, I don't have any firsthand accounts. Um, all of this is information collected from anthropologists, collected from um, folks writing in academia. So there isn't a lot of people <laughs> eating Bacchanawa root in the basement of, you know, a dormitory or, um, you know, kids chewing on Bacchanawa at their lunch break or, you know, it's not a, a recreational drug. In fact, it's really not known in the West. So um, for those who are listening and do know about it, awesome. Tell me more. I want to learn so much more about it. Um, but the secondhand accounts that anthropologists have brought down to us is that it's colorful, visionary. Some people describe flying or going to the spirit world, seeing ancestors. So that sounds to me very analogous to um, what I've experienced under the influence of psilocybin mushrooms. Um, so my hope is that this is something, you know, I, I don't expect it to be some miracle cure drug that people can use for this sort of thing. But if people can try it and uh, find some comfort for themselves, more power to them if they approach it with caution and knowing that I'm not suggesting it. <laughs> I want to emphasize that a lot. But, um, yeah, so this visionary plant, um, what what is its mechanism of action? Uh, for me, um, I've read many, many ideas about this, going all the way back to the 70s to modern times, 
unfortunately, uh, Dr. Salman said that in his culture, it's not important as much to know exactly what the chemicals are. They just know that it works and it works for their people. Um, and more power to him. I kind of agree. It matters less the science of it if it does work. Um, obviously for me, I want to know if it's safe. I want to know what the risks and drawbacks are. So I wish there was more information on what the chemical component is, but that is a big old question mark right now. Um, here's some ideas though. People have some ideas. Um, I have read in a book of alkaloids that, uh, you know, it does contain some, uh, unique alkaloids and that's as far as this reference material um, went. And I could probably uh, show you guys here. Let me see. I'm going to pause the video. Okay, so this is kind of what I'm contending with. So, um, yeah, this was a uh, book put out by Ralph Auf, right? And it is all plant alkaloids. So, this page, you see that's reference materials, chemical formulas. That's all this book is. So, it's a reference, but. Um, it got cited in um, a book that I read as well as in Salman's paper, I believe. And basically what this tells us is that, yes, a plant has alkaloids. And as you know, with the plant world, every plant has some sort of alkaloid in them, <laughs> right? So it doesn't tell me a whole heck of a lot. I'm not a chemist. So um, that was sort of a brick wall for me. I have a friend who might look at it for me at some point and we'll go from there. Um, but theories people have had, some people said there could be an MAOI in it. And, um, in talking to Dr. Salman, he thinks that's fairly unlikely. Um, the reasoning, um, I wasn't entirely sure about is sort of a, a brief back and forth we did. Um, but another interesting theory that I've also read, which I think could have some, uh, credence to it is that there's a symbiotic ergot that grows in the roots um, of the Bacchanawa. So theoretically, there is a basically a type of fungus growing inside symbiotically um, at the cellular level in the root of the Scirpus acutus bulrush. And that is pretty darn cool, if you ask me. Um, so theoretically, it might not even be the bulrush itself. It might be alkaloids uh, coming from an ergot. And for those of you who know what ergot is, that is effectively the plant, or I'm sorry, the fungus uh, that was discovered to have LSD in it uh, by Albert Hoffman, uh, synthesized that based on this al alkaloid found in ergot. So really interesting stuff. If it is because of an ergot, um, that would be neat. I hope someone does some research and figures out what makes this stuff tick. Um, because I sure want to know. And uh, I'd, I'd like to hear some more experiences with it. Um, so one thing I'm going to try to do is reach out to folks in that part of Mexico. Um, I have a few folks down there asking around about it right now um, who I've met through the Thank You Plant Medicine movement. So... Thank you guys if you are um, still working on that out there. I hope you are. I hope I do hear something back because it was kind of a shot in the dark to put that out there. Um, but if anyone does know anything about Bacchanal or Scirpus Acutus, I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. Um, I'd love to interview you if you've had personal experience with it. And, you know, as I grow these bull rushes out this summer, uh, maybe eventually I'll work up the chutzpah to try it. Um, but you know, the likelihood is that I won't. Here's what I've determined about how exactly um, it's used. My understanding is they boil it and use it as a tea. Um, so that that was some very interesting information as well. So theoretically, if I ever do try this stuff out, um, I'll probably take a very, very small portion, boil it, drink the tea, try a little more, a little bit more. But there there is some inherent risk in this kind of thing. Um, and of course, I want to know a lot more about it first. Um, some of the risk is that these bull rushes um, could a be misidentified. I, I feel fairly confident um, that Dr. Salman knows what he's talking about, and um, you know, so I'm, I trust his research. I trust the seed bank that I got these seeds from, 
and I trust that because I'm pretty good at growing plants, I'll be able to handle it and uh, get some Scirpus acutus out of this and give it a shot eventually, if I have enough information. Lots of qualifiers. Um, the, the other variable is other kinds of bulrushes have also been found to have psychoactive alkaloids, and not all of them good ones. Um, so if it's the wrong strain of Scirpus acutus, if it is the wrong species, if um, it has been identified as Scirpus acutus to mask what the real plant is and keep that cultural knowledge secret, um, that is a possibility as well. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of different possibilities out there. Um, but my main goal in doing this sort of little mini episode here with you is to tell you about um, Scirpus acutus, Bacchanawa, that I've been researching it, and see what you guys come up with. Because um, I would love to hear more about it. I'd love to have the psychedelic community maybe embrace one more plant teacher um, in its toolkit if we find as a community that it's safe. Um, and if we find that it's effective for dealing with um, some mental health issues like the Terra Humera use it for. Um, but yeah, this information that I had is now yours. And, um, you know, I've been keeping it to myself for too long. And I hope you guys do something with it and come back and tell me, hey, Ryan, you know, you know, I got a research grant to check this out. Um, do you want to hear what I find out and interview me in two years? And the answer to that question is yes. So, um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed. This was the Bacchanawa episode of Talking in Technicolor. Um, and again, as always, much love to you all. And stay safe. And I hope we will talk together soon. I'm, I'm glad you stopped by.